Hi everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel, and I have a very interesting talk today. It was actually inspired, I've been thinking a lot about different topics for talks, and this one in particular I think really hits at the core of who we are, not only as artists, but as human beings. But what I'm coming to realize, just by giving it my own thought, um, is who we are, the, who we are as artists has always been something that has been a question. How do you value art, right? And this is something that is, hasn't only translated into how we regard ourselves as individuals and contributors to humanity, but also to numerical value, okay? How do you translate artwork into money? And be, as a result of that, <clears throat> especially in the last, let's say, century, Putting a numerical value on artwork has been a very ambiguous subject. And an ambiguous subject, as, as ambiguity goes, uh, as far as the financial industry is concerned, when, when you don't have, a, when you don't have a, a clear enough cause for creating art or for hiring an artist, well, then there isn't a clear reason to, to pay them or pay them well enough. Yet, for some reason, Regardless of the fact that, that the true definition of why artists are employed, why artists are valuable, even though that's been in question, and even though our salaries have been in question, we continue to thrive. We continue to exist. We continue to be born. We continue to grow. We continue to evolve. We continue to contribute. We continue to be in need, yet that need is very often unclear. And this is actually the topic that I've been thinking about probably over the last month. And one of the things that really put a cap on my thought was a TED talk that came out just today, actually, because um, I, I watch TED all the time. It's by Yuval, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. It's a tricky name. Yuval Noah Harari. Okay. And what he explains is, uh, what his TED talk is called, What Explains the Rise of Humans? Why is it that if we go back thousands and thousands of years, Humans had no more value to this planet and were no more important to this planet than, you know, than butterflies and, and, and woodpeckers and jellyfish. Okay? Yet, something separated humanity from every other living creature on Earth to the point that today we dom we're the dominating species of this planet by a long shot. Okay? We pretty much control this planet and all of its resources for better or worse cause. Okay? That's a topic for another for another day. What 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 Yuval um, explores brilliantly, I might add. I really recommend you check it out. Is what are the elements that? What is the reason why? What are the elements that led to our domination of this planet? Okay, at least as far as we regard it, right? What is it that led to our domination? What is it that took us being from being pretty useless and insignificant? living creatures on this planet, along with every other living creature, to dominating this planet. And he says there's two things. There's two elements. The first is our ability to cooperate with each other and our ability to cooperate in a very flexible manner. Okay? And the example, the example he uses is chimpanzees. If you take one chimpanzee and one human and you put them on an island, chances are the chimpanzee is going to have a much easier time and thrive more in that environment. Okay, he has better survival skills. He's more adaptable in the in the in the sense of survival. Okay, if you were going to put your money on a chimpanzee or a human, chances are you probably put your money on the chimpanzee. If you put ten chimpanzees and ten humans, same result. Okay, but the difference lies the difference lies in mass cooperation, where you're dealing with thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people. What separates humans from every other animal is our ability to collaborate and cooperate with people, with millions and millions of other people worldwide. In essence, our very survival as the human species, are the very element of, uh, the, the very element that leads to us thriving in society is our ability to cooperate with millions and millions of other people. Think about it this way. This is how he describes it too, okay? I'm producing a video right now. I'm having a talk with you. Yet, I have no clue who produced this mic or this pop filter or that webcam or the lamp over my head or the computer or the internet 
I've never met any of them. I have no idea who they are. The modem, the desk, my keyboard, this house, everything was made by somebody. I was de My very survival and my very ability to communicate and share this message with you is dependent on the cooperation of hundreds, if not thousands, of other people just so I can send this message to you. Okay? Yet I don't know them. This is something that animals cannot do. Okay? Animals generally have a tendency to live and think more objectively. I'm hungry, find banana. Lion, run. That's how they communicate. We're humans communicate on another level and we have developed an, a flexible ability to communicate and to collaborate and to cooperate with each other either directly or indirectly in essence all of this stuff all of this stuff that I'm using to communicate with you right now are things that um, are things that I had no uh, no contribution in the making of I'm just using them and I'm trusting the expertise of another fellow human being to supply that for me okay I'm the only thing I'm responsible for sharing with you is my knowledge and my expertise and my ability to use other people's equipment effectively to be able to share this message with you okay it's a very interesting concept now that's just the first half the second half he describes is our imagination okay how do we get hundreds of thousands of people millions of people to all cooperate together well the again you're referring to what Yuval said um, it's our ability to tell stories fictional stories that everybody can believe in and the more believable and the more the more sway a fictional story has the more likely we are to believe it and when we when when we can get large numbers of people to believe that same story we will follow suit and that creates a certain sense of harmony and order okay but all of these stories all of these things that we believe these stories that we've been told are the essence are at the core of our existence okay so what do I mean by that well he says for instance take religion some wise respected somebody who's respected for their intelligence says you have to do these 10 things because this higher power called god told me that you have to do these 10 things we're talking catholicism in this case right you have to do these 10 things and if you don't do them you're going to go to hell and burn and suffer for all eternity and it was a story that was so convincing whether you believe it or not okay it was so convincing that millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people believed it as such, it helped to control the behavior and the thought of millions of people. Okay? Another example is, now, I don't mean to offend you if you're religious. It has nothing to do with that. It's just, this is a made-up story. Would, would, would monkeys do the same thing? Would monkeys say, you know, you have to give me ten bananas or, or, or you're going to go to hell? You have to, you have to behave properly or you're going to go to hell and suffer for all eternity? No. Everything, every decision they make is very objective. On a human level, most of the decisions that we make from day-to-day -day life, if we're not talking about our core fundamental survival things like eat, sleep, procreate, right? Everything else is very, is pretty much controlled by our imagination and the stories that we believe. Okay. Another example is laws. Think about the laws that govern cities, that govern govern humanity. Okay. Not to kill, not to steal, not to not to you know. Uh, do drugs whatever the case might be okay these laws were stories made up by people and as Yuval describes it and then these these master storyteller magicians called lawyers and politicians collaborated together to create a very very concrete story and they sent that story off to everybody else and that story included a punishment these are the rules that we made up fictionally and if you don't follow them you're gonna to go to jail you're gonna you're gonna do time you're gonna die in the electric chair whatever the case might be but these are fictional stories they were made up by somebody because there's no animal on earth that ever did that we are animals we are mammals just like every other every other mammal on earth we're living if you cut us open we have the same organs and the same makeup as every other animal on earth okay same if you study anatomy you realize very quickly that anatomy is very similar between every every different animal including our own 
okay? So at the core of everything that we are, are fictional stories. Another amazing example is money. Money in and of itself, a dollar bill or a thousand dollar bill, in and of itself, objectively, is absolutely useless, right? It's a piece of paper. It's a piece of green paper. You can't eat it. You can't drink it. You can't wear it. But some other magician, some finance minister, right, or some bank, some banking institution says, you know what? If you take the, this, this paper, this piece of green paper, is worth 20 bananas, right? So you go and you take this paper and you give it to another person and that person hands you 20 bananas. And you go, wow, it does work, doesn't it? So everybody starts to believe this story. In fact, he describes money as being the most, the most convincing and believable story ever told. You know, he's saying how Osama bin Laden hated America, hated American politics, hated American religion, but he had no problem with American currency. In fact, he quite liked it, <laughs> right? Very brilliant talk. You know, you really got to go check it out. So the wheels in my head are turning because I've already been thinking about, I've been asking my question, why, why art? What is, why are we artists? Why do artists exist? What's the purpose of them? Okay. What is the purpose of being an artist? Why is art so hugely valued yet so devalued and has been this way since as long as we can remember? Yet it is one of the most primitive yet prevailing skills that we have possessed through the course of humanity. You know, we can go back to the earliest, earliest indications, the earliest, uh, you know, the, the earliest uh, uh, evidence of human existence and we find art we find cave drawings and that has continued 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 all the way to today and there's always been a use and a purpose for art why what makes it so important how do we put value on art what is art what is the value of art it's very easy to think if you look at if you just scratch the sur surface of what art is art is just creating pretty pictures that people enjoy looking at okay that's really all it is creating pretty pictures of environments or characters or creatures or whatever okay that people enjoy looking at so why do we need that what's the purpose of that okay why do we why is this something that's so important why is this something that's prevailed if it was so completely useless if it was such an an arbitrary skill it wouldn't continue to exist it doesn't if you think about it in the in the you know in the whole socio-economic perspective of things what does it contribute to your fellow human being the way i don't know being a police officer police officer or or or, uh, or or a soldier that helps protect your safety or laws that help protect people from murder and and drug abuse and sexual abuse and all these different things these different horrible things we can we can do to each other okay what's the purpose and this is the question that has put artists in the back row of the of 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 the salary bracket forever well this talk by Yuval clarifies exactly what that value is exactly why we're valuable and incredibly needed, always have been, and always will be incredibly important, needed members of society. It is a service that we are doing for humanity that is at the core of who we are as humans. Because as Yuval describes, the major, the main thing that separates the human animal from any other animal on earth is our imagination, is our ability to visualize, is it to be able to come to to transform fiction into reality. And that is at the core of what an artist is. Many artists share this very similar belief. I've had this belief my whole time. I very often question humanity. <laughs> I do, I very often question, you know, I look at the way people dress and the way people behave and the type of technology people follow and the type of things people like and dislike and, you know, uh, and, and money in general. You know, I've questioned money very, very often. What's the importance of it? What's the purpose of it? Who, the, who controls it? Why, how does it control us? Why does money have a, such a strong control over us? Okay. All of, I question, I try to question humanity at its core, just the same way you Val did. Okay. Because there is no real tangible answer to any of it. 
everything I've always seen is pretty much a fictional story. I think that's probably one of the reasons why the movie Matrix really impacted people so much because it puts in question the whole reality of humanity as it exists. If, if our imagination is what separates us from every other animal on earth, then an artist is a person who controls the imagination of every single person on earth. We, our, our entire existence is to question reality and to bridge the gap between, between reality and fantasy. An artist can look at any situation, hear any story, listen to any song, look at any picture, anything, and be able to transform that in their brain to create new realities, to evolve our imagination, to evolve the species. So in essence, if we think about it that way, being an artist at its core is one of the major contributors to the evolution of humanity because we are helping our imagination to evolve. That's one of the reasons why we love to watch movies so much. It's a collaboration of artists, our bringing our ability to cooperate and collaborate in large numbers together. Programmers, artists, cinematographers, directors, producers, you name it, okay? Actors, set designers. And we all of these artists all collaborate together to create a large, elaborate, and believable reality that we as humans can live in, that we can experience. Video games are the same thing. I'm talking about modern forms of art. And, and Think Fact actually had a wonderful talk as well. His most recent, if you go on Think Fact on YouTube, he talks about the art of video games. And he was talking about, is art the greatest art form ever, ever created? Because he talks about, he puts art, he puts video games in the context of the history of art. Okay? And he talks about how, how in essence, what art is, what video games are, is art you can live in. It's living in the imagination of others, which is a very powerful experience. And it's funny, I remember when I used to work at EA, a lot of my friends that were all, you know, the big, big video game buffs, you know, and, and I remember at one point, uh, uh, somebody had asked me, what video games do you, what games do you play? And I said, I, I played a lot of World of Warcraft. That was one of the main games. I played that for years. I've been playing it since 2005. And one of my colleagues who, who was a bit of a, a douche, <laughs> you know, she says, why do you, why would you play that game? It's nothing but a fashion show. And she said it, of course, in an insulting fashion. And I thought to my, I, I, I said, yeah, I guess, you know, and then I, I kind of took me off guard with that comment. And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, well, yeah, that's exactly why I pay, play it. You know, do I play to be top DPS? Do I play to be the, to, you know, to be the number one guild? No. I've never played for that. I play because I'm an artist and I'm a visual person. And to me, it's living in an immersive world, a fantasy world, a, p a work of art that I can actually travel around. And World of Warcraft was one of the first experiences I ever had. And for most people too, okay? The actual ability to immerse yourself and look around in a place like Ashenvale or Barrens, you know? That kind of thing. And furthermore, yes, it was a fashion show. The whole incentive for me to keep playing was to get that cool looking set of gear, you know, tier three warlock armor or something like that, you know? To me, it was about the fantasy, uh, visual fantasy. That is who I am. That's at the core of who I was. So, damn it, had I been back there, had, sh had I been able to rewind time and went, that's nothing but a fashion show. I'd go, yeah, well, I'm an artist. That's why I play. That would have been my answer. But back then I was taken off guard. So damn it, I missed my opportunity, right? Our, at the core of who we are as artists, we are the builders, the creators and the builders of our imagination. And as such, depending on which direction we want to take it, abstract or realistic, we are always playing. We are always, we are always, we're at that crossroads between fantasy and reality. And without that, without the, without the genius and the contribution of artists, the evolution of humanity would, would slow down to a halt, wouldn't it? We need that human connection to bridge that gap between the practical and the impractical, between the objective and the fantastical in order to create new realities because that's at the evolution of, of humanity and that translates into every type of art that you think about it from fantasy art for trading card games and video games and film to the design of lamp poles and houses and cars okay to the desk 
to this headset, to my modem, to everything on earth that you look at was created by the imagination of an artist, either a fantasy artist or a technical artist or an industrial artist. But they are, are artists because they're the type of people that can create something out of nothing. And if it wasn't for that, we would cease to evolve. So the next time you're negotiating a salary with somebody and they're saying, why would I pay an artist if you're if you're if you're a part of that whole argument that artists should be paid more and, and deserve more? There's a very good starting point for you. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. Remember, I have a mentorship as well. If you're interested in eight week intensive mentorship, Lucid Pixel. So you can give me a shout and I'll leave all of the uh, I'll, I'll leave all of the info in the description. And remember to like and thumbs up. All right. Take care.